Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Redis Beard Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Martin. This week, I want to tell you guys a story about a time that I crashed a wedding. Now, it wasn't any typical wedding. This one was something special. Stay tuned, and I'll tell you all about it. But first, I want to mention that some great things, pretty exciting for me, have been happening lately. Firstly, I got a sponsor for the podcast, which means that now, since this is my full-time job, every time I get played, I get paid. So, if you haven't had a chance to listen to all the episodes yet, or you haven't really shared them around, I would really, really appreciate it if you could do that. Every play helps. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast for as little as $1 per month, and that goes directly to me to help me pay my bills while I do this as my full-time gig. All the support that I've received so far, you guys are amazing. I appreciate it. Let's keep it going. And I really, really hope that you enjoy all the content that I bring you from now on. Hey, everybody. This is Sean Martin, a.k.a. The Reddest Beard. Are you interested in starting your own podcast, just like I did? You can check out the Anchor app or anchor.fm. That's what I use to create my podcast episodes. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit the podcast right from your phone or in your computer browser. Anchor actually distributes your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even more platforms. You can make money from your podcast like I do, with no minimum listenership. Best of all, it's free. So, if you want everything that you need to make a podcast in one place, go download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. All right, everybody, as promised, my story about crashing a wedding. Quick side note about this, however, I'm going to be reading one of my written works. So when it's posted online, you'll be able to play it to hear me narrate the story or read it at your own leisure, whichever one you like. I've gotten feedback so far that some people love my written work and other people prefer to just listen to the podcast. So I'm bringing you a little bit of both this time. Hope you enjoy. What are you doing right now? I read that text and had to double check it to make sure that I had actually read it correctly. It was in my third or maybe fourth, depending on how I rank them, language, which is Hebrew. It was also 10 o'clock at night, and I'd been up since 5.30 a.m. and worked all day. Nothing, what's up? I replied. Really, I was in bed contemplating the nature of hummus and trying to remember why I decided that three pounds of it would be a good idea for my dinner. My stomach was heavy, to say the least, and I didn't have anything to drink in the room. Get ready. I'm on the way to your hotel. We're going to crash a wedding. Details when I get there. Okay. He had my full attention. No, Dima. Details now, please. A full two minutes passed as I made my way from laying on my bed to the upright and seated position on my bed. Like I said, I was tired, full, and it had been a long freaking day. Finally, the phone rang. I mean, dude, you know I'm going with you, but what the hell, man? Hey, listen, my buddy just called me. He's at a wedding of another one of our friends. I don't know that guy so well, but I know him kind of. Anyway, they're doing a TV show about fast marriages, and there aren't a lot of people there, so he wants me to bring people. Put on nice pants and don't wear sandals. Wait, 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 Dima. You want me to bring more people? Yeah, but my car can only hold four, he lied. Last year, we had easily fit five into it and could have had seven if he had just listened to me and ignored the rule about pretty Israeli girls needing seatbelts and not sitting on my lap. Okay, right. I'll see you when you get here. No sandals, Sean. Uh, you're breaking up? <sighs> Can't hear you. See you soon. I hung up. On the car ride to the banquet hall, I would ponder what exactly it meant about me that I could send a text message to three people after 10 o'clock at night reading put on nice clothes, we are crashing a wedding, and have them all present and accounted for in the parking lot less than 15 minutes later. I can only imagine the stress the poor girls went through trying to figure out what constituted nice clothes 
for a wedding crashing in a foreign country late at night. Dima, Nick, and myself walked out of the hotel, and the girls were running downstairs screaming, what the hell do we wear at us? But they were there, my stalwart soldiers, ready for a party. There was Nick, my ever-present hetero life mate, tall, dark-haired, hawkish good looks. He had made a name for himself on our summer program the previous year as being a bit of a loose cannon. Some people disliked his willingness to do whatever he wanted whenever he wanted to do it without giving another thought to whatever it was he was doing. It would come as a surprise to no one that Nick and Sean had gone gallivanting around in the middle of the night when we were supposed to be awake at 6 a.m. the next morning to pack our things and leave the country. Then there was Gina, a first year teaching program fellow from the East Coast of the U.S. Tall, thin, fair, pretty, mild mannered. I doubt most people would have expected her to jump into a car and go like this. I was really proud of her. Then there was Lacey, a second year returnee that by this time I could only imagine was used to my tomfoolery. Shorter than Gina, but also pretty and a little more curvy. I knew from past experience that this quiet and seemingly shy girl could run with the crazy kids all night long. Oh, the secrets she could tell. The host of this whole endeavor was Dima, an Israeli of Russian descent from a town nearby. He's shorter than me, well-built with dark features and a heavy brow. When he smiles, he looks like he's got a secret that he loves that you shouldn't know. He speaks English with minimal accent and loves to make fun of me in Russian because by now I understand enough Hebrew to know when to tell him to get bent. His dark sense of humor was the reason I knew that we would be lifelong friends. It was that ever-present sense of gallows humor that made most Israelis so endearing to me. The girls look good. Nice dresses. Makeup done well. No short order for a quick escape. Nick's hair looked like he had rolled straight out of bed yet managed to be stylish. It was the kind of good look that gaunt billboard models for high-end labels pay thousands of dollars for on the East Coast. Nick gets it naturally out of a habit of sleeping late and just not giving a fuck. Dima was dressed for an Israeli wedding, which means button-down shirt, nice trousers, clean shoes. I was wearing the fanciest clothes that I had, blue jeans, a button-down shirt, and why do you have on sandals, Sean? Dima, we're crashing a wedding. Tevas are the least of my problems. Also, they're Israeli. They're American. The name is just Hebrew. Yeah, same, same. As we rushed to the car and pulled out of the lot, I made the usual introductions. Ladies, this nice, strange man that you just got into a car with is Dima. Dima, this is Lacey and Gina. Everyone paused for a second just to take in the fact that they had technically just gotten into a stranger's car in the middle of the night in a foreign country. The girls didn't seem as concerned as Dima did about this, however. Uh, it's okay, though. Sean and Nick have known me a while. I'm not a strange guy. Dude, you make me sound like some kind of pervert or something. Wait, I might actually have candy. So you could say that we lured you in properly. Dima really is harmless, Nick added. The most dangerous thing he does is forget to look up when he's chasing Pokemon through the courtyard at the hotel. The girls laughed at this, and we all exchanged pleasantries and basic information. He finally filled us in on more details. It turned out the girls knew the American TV show that was the cause of all of this excitement, so their interest went up tenfold. There was also a real possibility that we would make it onto a show as extras in the background during the wedding fo footage. We'd have to sign non-disclosures and make sure we didn't tell any secrets before the episode aired. And we couldn't share any images or videos we took of the wedding party or the happy couple on social media before it aired either. Other than that, we're going to be able to just enjoy the fun, and it would be our little secret. We arrived at the banquet center and parked the car. Dima handed me the keys as I would be driving back. Lacey threatened to kill me if I left them as some sort of joke, and I could tell that by this point, she knew me too well. We tried to act normal when we walked in. The thing is, not one of us knows what normal for an Israeli wedding is, except for Dima. This was the first for all of the rest of us. We arrived before the dinner portion of the evening, but after the actual ceremony. The groom was, like Dima, local Russian descendant and from the same town. Most of the guests were his family and his friends. The only ones representing the bride beautiful young Jewish girl from the U.S., were her parents and a couple of close friends that had made the trip. Otherwise, it was old Russian immigrants and ridiculously attractive young Israelis. 
the Russians had already been draining bottles of booze, and the younger people were out on the dance floor tearing it up to some Euro trash techno. This was probably going to be fun. Dima made some introductions for us. We met his friend, the one that said he wanted more people there. We met about half a dozen people who didn't speak much English and exchanged pleasantries as best we could. Then we made our way to the bar. Alcohol, the great social lubricant that it is, didn't fail to deliver. Now, I don't drink, but I also don't suffer from any sense of what people might call shame. So after about 30 minutes, we were all much more relaxed and dancing away. During dinner, I made my way to the bride to declare a mazel tov and thank her for a wonderful party. Since she didn't know most of the people in attendance, she didn't know that we were crashing. When she heard my American accent, she completely freaked out with joy. She came over to our table and was so happy to see other Americans there that were friends of friends of friends. She actually cried a little. Dima, having unfortunately left me unattended for a whole three minutes while he went to talk to his friends, comes storming back over. Why is the bride crying, Sean? What the hell did you do? Now, that was a fair question. She stepped in, though. Thanked Dima a million times for bringing friendly Americans so she didn't feel completely like the only stranger in a strange land at her own wedding. We sat with everybody, ate dinner, had chats and conversations like normal. We were all working for the summer in local schools as summer school English teachers, and so we were actually quite a hit. All of the older folks knew about the local schools because their children had either gone to one or they knew children who had gone to one. Hearing that a bunch of American teachers were there to teach in their little corner of the world was both surprising and impressive to them. This was the usual reaction we got in Israel. Most Israelis seemed perplexed that we would give up the comforts of the USA, where all of them seemed to want to go, by the way, to come and visit the homeland of our ancestors when life in Israel is not always so easy. You'll know what comes next. Glow sticks. Shots, body shots, weird hats, Mardi Gras beads. You name it, it happened. Booty shaking, dirty dancing, jumping around. Gina even gave out a salsa dancing lesson. Salsa dancing. Like, I'm telling you, this girl, she's a total sleeper. You just would never see it coming. There was a man that actually came out in a giant caricature costume of a Hasidic rabbi to dance with everyone, too. That, for me personally, was probably the most memorable part of the evening because I've never seen a costumed Hasidic rabbi grind freak dancing so many people. Well, I've never seen it at all, but this image will be scarred into my psyche for decades to come. The groomsmen actually were all wearing t-shirts that read in Hebrew, the bride can't read Hebrew and our buddy just got a green card. And the bride had a t-shirt that said, in Hebrew, I'm the green card. I held my tongue about her shirt when she looked at my sandals and smirked while saying, nice shoes. I didn't think it was the best idea to piss off the bride on her wedding night. On the ride back to our hotel, finally, we all agreed to refuse to mention what happened for as long as we could hold out when and if people asked. We knew we couldn't keep this little gem to ourselves forever especially once drunk people started returning from their last night out activities and declaring what an awesome time they had, because we knew we'd won. The girls bid farewell and good night, and Dima, Nick, and I went to the courtyard to set up our hookah for our nightly ritual. On their way upstairs, Lacey commented, if you ever need to bring people to a last minute party again, you know who to call. We set up the hookah in the darkened courtyard on this little northern desert palace and sat back to look at the clear night skies. You know that smell on the drive back was my parking brake burning because you didn't take it off, right? Asked Dima. Not my fault. You elected to let the sober person drive. When he fucks it up, it's on you for drinking. I'm not really sure that's how it work, Nick added, because he's a traitor. It'll be fine. It's not like you use it that often anyway, right? Every day, Sean. We use them every day in this country. The air filled with the aroma of the fruit-flavored tobacco, and we chatted idly about nothing of much importance at all. People straggled back in, 
in clearly varying states of inebriation and decided to flop down and talk with us. They wanted to compare stories of our last night and theirs. We just laughed and listened, but we didn't share too much. The intrigue was killing them, but that was our intent. The stars shone brightly, and the conversations flowed and waned, and eventually we all went to bed knowing that we wouldn't be together like this again for at least one more year. Why'd you invite us out tonight, Dima? You could have taken anyone. I knew you guys would do it. You never say no. You'll jump at the chance to do anything crazy just for the story. That's all for this week. I suppose I can leave you all with a question. What would you do for the story? Is there anything crazy that you've done just to say you've done it? My life's full of those things, but that's because I choose to live it that way. I know not everybody does, but I think a lot of us have that one crazy story that we can't believe we actually did. So, if you have one, reach out, let me know. Go on my Facebook page, leave a comment in Anchor or on any of the platforms that you use to listen to this. Send me an email. Join the mailing list at thereddestbeard.com. Give me some feedback. Let me know what you think. If I get some good stories, we'll even give them a shout out on the show. Like, subscribe, follow, do all the things. Remember, you can follow through the Anchor app. Every play matters, so listen to it on any platform that you can. That's all for this week. I'll see you again next week. This has been Tales from the Reddest Beard. Thank you.